evening, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. If there was any doubt of the reason why we're here, the applause set the tone. Please another applause for Chief Keith Richards, OBE. This is going to be short and sweet. Huge apologies for the late start. Never Quite the Insider is a documentation of the familiarity and unique experience with Nigeria of Chief Keith Richards, OBE. Um, there's a part of it that I really like. I'm going to read it very quickly. As a manager, it has not been that I wanted to become African, but I wanted to eschew that traditional expatriate point of separateness, to be truly engaged and to respect the position of the local stakeholders. If this means that to work, that to some work colleagues and even some expatriate friends, I have gone bush, so be it. So, Oyibo, Niger man, Keith Richards, another applause for him. <laughs> Very, very quickly, let me call on this very interesting lady. She's here, <laughs> former editor of the now-rested Next newspaper, co-creator of Straight Talk Interviewing Nigerians Decision Makers. She's currently a member of the judging panel of the Wale Shuinka Center for Investigative Journalism. She also sits on the board of trustees of Premium Times Center for Investigative Journalism and Promacido Kill Awards. She's also a member of the Nigerian Guild of Editors. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure and honor to present Kaderia Ahmed to take the floor, please. And of course, all protocols duly observed. Um, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, you have to forgive me. I've never had the honor of chairing this sort of occasion. So actually, I'm not fully I'm sure of what I'm supposed to do, but um, it is a pleasure and a privilege to be sitting on stage with Professor Wole Shoinka, of course, as well as Chief uh, Keith Richards. Um, Keith is a good friend, and I first met Keith um, because I was hoping to put together a program the like of which had never been seen in Nigeria before. I wanted to do the Nigerian version of Hard Talk. And everybody I approached for support basically said to me, this sort of program is not going to work in this country because people in authority do not like being questioned. In the end, Keith Richard and Promacido were the people who had confidence in my vision and they supported um, uh, the two years run that we had with, uh, with Straight Talk and, and that was really awesome. But we're here today to talk about his book and it is my real honor and privilege to chair this occasion. Um, I won't say much, except that um, we will get an opportunity after Professor Wole Shoinka has actually delivered his review to ask a few questions, and I'll come back to the audience as well to engage. So um, help me in welcoming once again the people on stage. Thank you. Bankole Olayebi, he refused to sit up here, but now you're here. You're supposed to do an intro for Keith Richards, so let's welcome him as he comes up here. Professor Walishonika, Keith Richards, and uh, Kadria. Distinguished ladies and uh, gentlemen, um, I'm extremely delighted to be uh, to welcome you to this um, occasion. Um, it's uh, about Kit's book, Never Quite the Insider. Um, Kit will be formally introduced in the course of the program, but I just want to say that as publishers, um, it's our great pleasure to be able to say that this book and Kit Richards are now on our list. Um, as I said to Kit the other day, if we hadn't, if I hadn't published this book, uh, it most certainly would be uh, top of my current reading list. But of course, I'm sure that you'd expect me to say that because I've published it. <laughs> but um, uh, seriously, um, for me as a publisher, and, and I consider myself also a passionate consumer of the written word, I have found my encounter with uh, Keith Richards never quite the insider, immensely worth the effort. But you do not have to take my word for it. I would only ask you to pause for a moment or two
to consider the profile of the gentleman who is going to review the book today. Now, whatever else you may think of him, you certainly cannot deny that he knows a thing or two about storytelling and how the written word works. I do not know that uh, Wale Shoenka reviews books on a regular basis. So there must have been something he found in this, I believe, uh, for him to agree or decide to review it. And like many of you in this audience, I'm quite eager to hear what he has to say about this book. And um, as you will see uh, from reading the book, I hope you pick up a copy of the book or two, Keith's storytelling is incredible. Um, now, what he's tried to do here is document his life in the corporate world. Um, before we finally put the uh, material to press, we took quite a look at it. I mean, Keith was, as if you know Keith, he doesn't mince his words, he doesn't pull his punches. And we found some of this stuff a bit too hard to handle. Um, and we had to navigate you know, that terrain. Um, fortunately, it was agreeable, and we pared it down to what you have today. But even, even what has been published is quite explosive. But I certainly do not have any regrets at all uh, in saying that this has been a worthwhile addition to our list. Uh, but beyond the pleasure and the satisfaction of publishing this book, uh, it is our hope that others will be inspired to document their lives, their experiences in business, in politics, and what have you. Uh, it is my opinion, both as a publisher and a reader, that we need to write more books, publish more books in this country. We need to tell our story. We need to engage with each other and start a discussion or continue the discussion on why our nation is the way it is and how we must, you know, go forward and make progress. And so without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I thank you for coming and I hope you enjoy the rest of the session. Uh, it's my pleasure to call on Keith Richards. Good morning, everybody. Well, first of all, thank you very much for coming. Um, and I see a lot of familiar faces and faces of friends. So let me start by just saying thanks to everybody for all your support, because without a lot of the people here, we wouldn't be, I wouldn't be here. And of course, let me say thanks to Prof, Kadra, and of course, to Bancoli. It's, it's a very, very great pleasure to be able to have a conversation with someone like Professor Shuenka and compare notes on the experience of, with our publisher. You don't, trust me, that makes me feel like uh, I'm a professional writer or some, something like that. It's a very great pleasure. So I'm going to read one or two uh, small extracts. Um, um, the book broadly, it, it has a bit of introduction and explains uh, how I came to be here. A little of my early engagement and therefore touches on some of the history of Guinness in Nigeria. And then my time at John Holt, um, my time in Abba, and then at Guinness, and then it finishes then. So I'm just going to read a little bit, start off, about uh, my experiences in ABBA. Um, particularly, I don't think Oat is here, but it's one of Oat's favorite pieces that he always used to tell me that if I ever write a book, this has to be in it. And the, the background to it was when I got to ABBA, there was a security crisis. After 8.30 or night, the police did not go out. It was too dangerous for the police to go out. So the local 
uh, the market people, Alaba Market and the other markets in Aba, brought in Bakassi, uh, the vigilante group. And they started okay, uh, but after a while, they took over. Things took over life of their own. The bodies on the side of the road on a Monday morning after their executions grew more numerous. And then the minority shareholders that we were fighting decided that they would hire Bacassi to try and intimidate us to hand over the business to them. So that's the background. So given the prominence of IEA, that was the company, and the turbulence of our own situation, it always seemed likely that sooner or later I would have the pleasure of dealing with this group of gentlemen. Normally, informal security would be delegated to a Nigerian manager, but in this case, at the insistence of Bakassi's leader in Aba, Como, it would be my responsibility to deal direct with him. Onwuke, that's the other shareholders, and his team had approached to Bakassi to help throw us out of the factory, making all sorts of the usual allegations. However, even as lawless as a group as Bakassi would tend to think twice about attacking foreigners for fear of the additional exposure this might lead to. And I suspect, too, that Como quite fancied the idea of intimidating an Anocha personally, hence his insistence on a personal meeting. I was certainly not going to venture into his territory, and as they were usually active late in the day, I invited him to the house in the evening. Being very hospitable, I naturally invited him to have a drink and a seat. I remember well that his lieutenants were not allowed to sit or to drink, but stood behind him. Discipline, if that's what you would call it, was tight. Hot drink was duly offered and accepted and we sat facing each other over the dining table in my living area as he placed his machete on the table. Funnily enough, I don't remember feeling his behaviour as particularly aggressive. In fact, he appeared to be tired and slightly sluggish, probably weed-related, and his eyes were a bit red-rimmed. He was probably a bit nonplussed at being offered a drink, uh, and hadn't expected social pleasantries, and his exposure to expatriates would have been limited. He wasn't an exceptionally large man, but well-built, but his English was certainly reasonable. And I do remember thinking that this was a surreal moment, and wondering how many people he had ordered killed, and indeed, how many had died directly by his hand but the evening was to become more surreal yet. Over several glasses of Johnny Walker Red, slugged rather than sipped, Como explained the situation. He had been offered payment by certain parties to work for them and chase us out. They had told him we were intimidating the workforce, stealing the equipment and running the company down. And, he had, and we had to be stopped. So he had come to see for himself, as he was a serious businessman and couldn't accept a contract unless he knew it to be genuine. He can now see that this isn't obviously true, that the business is working and I am a serious person, so he would consider working for us. Protection. However... I would obviously need to compensate him for turning down their contract. I responded that I appreciated his openness and professionalism and talked about how many jobs we were providing and how it was we, not the other party, who were doing the right thing. As a patriotic Nigerian, he should help us without demanding money because we were struggling and if we failed, all those people would lose their jobs. The negotiation was on. Now, I am not a good negotiator, and Nigerians are the best, Abby. But I had 
Wingle Esumai, my tri trusted advisor by my side, and we were able to break off from time to time and confer um, to buy time. The sums seemed fairly low, but we were hemorrhaging cash, paying security expenses, and there was the principal. He was stuck at 100,000 naira a month, and I was at 40,000 naira, and neither was moving. His tone darkened somewhat, though he stayed calm. He ex exclaimed that if I was not prepared to pay for their services, then he would be forced to work with the other side, and this would mean they would be able to take over the factory. With a little more menace in his voice, he said, in which case, there was nothing I could do to stop him. All well and good, I responded. But you will have to step over my dead body. No problem, he replied calmly. To which I asked, do you know what happens to a black man if you step over a white man's dead body? He looked at me. You will never have issue again. At that moment, I was somewhere above myself looking down and thinking, what the fuck? <laughs> I had absolutely no idea where that came from, nor what made me say it. Most likely, I was aware of the saying, Beke Nawabara, excuse my pronunciation, which means the white man is a spirit. And Bakasi were very much uh, known to believe in magic. So it was probably playing somewhere in the back of my mind. But anyway, it worked. Without any histrionics, Como paused and considered my comment. Within a few more minutes of discussion, we concluded at 50,000 naira a month for effectively what was his protection. After a few pleasantries and another glass of scotch, off they went, leaving me to ask myself if what had just happened was what I thought it was. So, thank you. So I, I ended up staying for a couple of years in enjoying the delights of uh, Abba and Bakassi. And later when I joined Guinness, uh, Como had become a politician. Um, who knows? Today he may be sitting in our National Assembly. It wouldn't surprise me at all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. If that doesn't excite you in getting a copy of the book, I don't know what else will. Human life has meaning only to that degree, and as long as it is lived in the service of humanity. Born in 1934 in Nigeria and educated in England, the playwright and political activist became the first African to receive the Nobel Prize for Literature. I welcome and present to you playwright, poet, author, political activist, teacher, hunter, and wine connoisseur, Professor Wally Shoinka. Thank you, good morning, and welcome. Um, one of my favorite poets, I had to plead with him. Uh, I had to plead with him, I said, Please, you know, I love your poetry, but when you read your own poems, you ruin those poems for me. Anytime you have to read your poems in public, please send for me wherever I am. I volunteer my services free of charge, but please stop ruining your own poetry by reading them yourself. Well, I cannot say the same for Keith. I didn't know he was such a, a dramatist. He's a, he's a powerful reader of his own stuff, and I'm sure other people's stuff. In fact, he told me uh, earlier when we were over there that he actually had a walk-on part in which he had just one word, one word to say. They needed Anoyimbo, 
and he fitted the bill, and all he had to do was just say one word. I'm going to get hold of those people and let them know that they wasted an opportunity. And the next time, they should give him a part really worthy of his talent. It's a real marvelous performer. So now, never quite an insider. Memoirs of a ghetto blaster. <clears throat> we mostly see that peculiar species known as, oh, before I continue, you know, it's amazing. <laughs> he picked on a passage, which in fact, I cite in here. You know, I'm getting worried about you, because many similarities you begin to worry me. Anyway, we mostly um, see that uh, peculiar species, the expatriate. We see them as they really are, or if you prefer, see them as they be. On festive occasions, a wedding, child naming ceremony, retirement party, chieftaincy conferment, funeral outing, simply on social occasions. I rely mostly, of course, on the testimony of media photos when they are togged out in local traditional dress, registering varying degrees of adjustment and ease, discomfort, self-mockery and or sense of duty, and capacity for endurance. At such occasions, you can see it written on their faces. You just wait until my pub mates in Shropshire see me in this costume. Actually, it's more likely to read, if you ever catch me again in this Agbada or Bavariga outfit, call me a so and so and so. You can virtually read on their faces, images of that longed for release when they can get back to some rational office clothing or after hours tennis shorts at the club, nursing a cold beer or perhaps Guinness since we are largely in uh, Guinness territory here, going by the author's uh, business and bibulant affiliations. In and out of their comfort zone, however, the word expatriate at once identifies and simultaneously alienates them in relation to their temporary or adopted home. Here is our own author's take on that defining sartorial infliction. I quote, I harbor a suspicion that there's actually a subtle practical joke in the gift of local dress. He, that is the white uh, recipient, will be told by his Nigerian friends that he looks fine. But there will be a snigger, a, there will be sniggers, mostly by his expatriate, expat colleagues um, uh, behind his back. As always in this book, mildly buried within that seemingly straightforward point of view or of the physical sartorial torture is a sociological barb. Here it comes. I quote, the next practical joke by gift is the full agbada. This is the ubiquitous outfit worn by big men all over the West Coast. Traditionally, it consists of trousers with a cord at the waist, usually with a matching ankle length, long sleeved shirt, but always topped up with a voluminous and free flowing agbada itself. Are you sure it's ankle length? I think it's usually about this one. Yeah, get your facts right. <laughs> the whole point about the heavily embroidered and open sided square of the Agbada is that it is highly impractical. This, here it comes, this is intentional, as big men are supposed to have practical things done for them, not by them. True or false? Well, we leave it at arguable. But that very comment stamps our author's narrative and analytical temper, which is candor, setting it down as perceived and as experienced. You can depend on Keith Richards not to miss a chance to put his colleagues, friends, antagonists, and environment on the spot, if not exactly through the ringer. Even within what appears to be a straightforward delineation of local color and neutral seeming data, 
there lurks the hidden sociological barb to wipe the complacent smile off the reader's face, dealing right and left, expatriate or local, without discrimination and without any pietistic concessions. Keith Richards does not subscribe to that doctrine that I often describe as one of moral flaccidity known as political correctness. I find that refreshing. I suspect even over and above the engrossing content, in turn dramatic, hilarious, informative, etc., that defining attitude contributed, I suspect, largely to my accepting to play a role in the promotion of these memoirs. In any nation that is plagued by a bloated collective ego, it is essential that the balloon of self-regarding be periodically lanced by the scalpel of outsider perception, especially where the lancet is cauterized in the flames of searing personal experience. And talking of personal experience, the other reasons I think which just made me absolutely uh, quite happy and content to, um, to do a review or be involved in any way in this publication is the similarity, the paralleling of experience between Keith Richards and myself. Whether we're talking of my activities in Koja, my experience in Koja, the, um, as far back as Koja, the All-Africa Games, which are, uh, whose opening and closing ceremonies are organized, whether we're talking about Festac 77, whether we're talking about even my stint as chairman of the uh, CBCIU, the uh, Commission or Center for Black uh, um, uh, Civilization and International Understanding, recently in Oshogbo, whether we're talking about Lagos at 50, the organization of that uh, year-long event, which nearly uh, at which I think I also expended one of my, the second round of my nine lives. Uh, <clears throat> no matter the, including my experience with the Road Safety Corps, which I inaugurated in this country, when I began reading Keith Richards' book, which is virtually nonstop, I found each episode virtually paralleled by my own experiences in the jungle, in the jungle of corruption, which has fastened on every single facet of Nigerian life. And so I think it was a feeling that, well, I don't have to even set pe pen to paper about this. All I have to do when people ask me, how did you do in this and this event? I'll say, turn to chapter this, page this, of Keith Richard's book, and you'll find exact replica of the kind of experiences which I understood. I think this was a major fact, uh, major reason behind my very readily accepting uh, to play a role in this. However, we must not abandon the theme of the expatriate persona just yet as a study in its own right. And as a lit motif of this no holes barred business audit, never quite an insider. The very title provokes a closer look at a condition that we tend to take for granted, albeit an ambiguity in itself. It presents in advance a creature in liminal existence who must, however, take himself or herself out of that limbo from which, paradoxically, he has to function. He has to get to know and to be known by people and forge strategies for professional productivity and sometimes even survival. This psychological fit of that title is the basis for all manner of interactions and decisions, and no matter the nature of the profession, from the pastoral and educational, to the technological, from the academic, to the commercial, it straddles the desk bound and the gritty hands on energy intensive and sometimes even dangerous enterprises, hovering as an in-between often provides unusual insights 
no matter how controversial. The expatriate mission, whatever it is, is to edge his way inside, even when being left outside in the rain, to become a part of, a student of, entangled with his or her peopled field of operations, some evidently much deeper than others. Portions of Keith Richards' experience remind me very much of a book by, bus um, by a business investigator who was hired to probe a death in Burkina Faso. The author of that work was a Brazilian. He near literally crashed through a protection barrier that had been created around me in the city of Minas Gerais in Brazil after two days of frustrated efforts. This obsessed man eventually switched to the simple strategy of waiting for me in the hotel cafe, having discovered somehow that I went regularly for my espresso fix first thing early in the morning before other clients arrived. And so he cornered me and presented me with his book. But not just with the book. It was mine, he said, an outright gift also, not the copy, an outright gift of all the intellectual rights contained in that book. And he brought a pre-signed document with him. I was intrigued. The story went thus, he'd been sent to Ouagadougou by an American-based company to find out what happened to the original partner who in fact had been responsible for bringing them into that country in the first place. That partner brought in government officials, bureaucrats, he did everything the right way, and they, of course, brought in their own partners, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And he kicked and threatened to expose what they were trying to do. And one day, he vanished. He left his home to go to a meeting, and that was the end of it. That was the last his family saw of him. And so this American company hired this Brazilian investigator to find out what had happened to their partner. Well. He succeeded, succeeded so well that he actually found out the baobab tree under which he was buried. Of course, when he returned, the problem began. Political considerations, interest, business interest, future, etc., etc. He found that every effort was being made to kill that report. And so when he heard I was in Brazil, he hunted me down and gave me this book. And all he asked, was that I should ensure that it was made into a film. He said, I will die content if I just see that event on the screen. If we ever find uh, Keith uh, near a baobab tree, I'm sure he'll be under the shade, not under the ground, <laughs> nursing a glass of Guinness. You know, <laughs> A final word of commendation and an inducement to such would-be filmmakers, Keith Richards does not present us with stereotypic type uh, people, just people. A truthful parade of individuals, groups, families, and associate consortiums, team workers as well as the conniving, loyal and disloyal, thieving and principled, self-sacrificing and self-promoting, egotistical, self-retiring, gifted, retarded, some oozing at the pores from overdose of integrity, while others conform to former Prime Minister David Cameron's description, fantastically corrupt. The designation of corruption as uniquely Nigerian or indeed African phenomenon has, however, always been a demonstrable fallacy. But Keith Richards contributes to that debunking by taking us through its refined operations in corporate activities. Here is our author's comment on that basically prejudicial uh, categorization by camera. I quote, a corrupt expatriate can make collusion and manipulation even easier and identification even trickier. There's still a general assumption that expatriates are more honest, a major misconception, as my John Holt experience illustrates. We hear a lot, I think that's end of quote, thank you. We hear a lot about whistle 
blowers these days. Well, this book is one grandfather of all whistle blowing. <laughs> indeed, indeed, his explosive indictments of his own expatriate colleagues deserve a totally different designation. I've said it. I think ghetto blaster. We talk of some governors, even legislators, blindly cutting away government furniture and fleets of luxury vehicles from assigned quarters or selling such to themselves and at rock bottom prices. Well, just follow the careers of some of Richard's colleagues and the abysmal bargain approach to company property as they moved home or transfer on transfer or simply changed residence. Most endearing of all, however, about this book is that he is himself quite candid about his own perceived shortcomings, the road not taken, rational or productive options discarded, avoidable failures incurred, etc., etc. One other book by a businessman actually comes to mind, Dr. Gibunov's own narrative of life in the murky world of business, with the same lament, the loss of developmental opportunities to the exodus of serious-minded business ventures. They abruptly curtail productive lifespan of enterprises that would have soaked up the swelling army of the unemployed, all thanks to that voracious bugbear, corruption. With books like these, Nigerians had better sit up and take notice and stop saying that it's just Wale Shoenka all over again talking. Failure to accede to the implicit cautionary of this book and others like it is a nightmare scenario captured so frighteningly. In the following words, the narrative of Keith's acknowledged most challenging posting near literally a war zone, which he referred to. This happens to be Abba, but was applicable to many cities at that time of his biographical witnessing. Let me just read that portion again. About the time when I arrived in Abba, the degree of lawlessness that I, Abians had to contend with had about reached its nadir. As the evening's traffic flow quietened down by as early as 9 p.m., the streets became quiet. You really did not want to be out and about after 9.30 p.m. unless you were able to take a major risk a risk so great that the police themselves refused to exit their station compounds after that time. This was seriously impacting on business and made traveling to and from the markets difficult. If you read nothing else in this challenging book, be certain not to miss that chapter that so offhandedly lays out the diabolical nexus of business, crime, and corruption. Then, if you do find the courage, visit the famous Ore Junction that links Ondo Ogun and Edo states. Speak to the normal denizens of that space. Ask them to describe what that junction was like even as recently as two years ago. The vitality, the bustling market and eating concourse of humanity. Its last stop, its last stop filling station for motorists before plunging eastwards or northwards. Compare then to now. Then ask, what has caused such a deleterious change? What has turned that concourse into a ghost junction? And so rapidly. And I'm speaking of a time long before the daughter of a famous political leader was shot down in cold blood at that very intersection, a comparatively recent event. So this has nothing to do with that high profile truly depressing assassination, an event that is still filled with unanswered questions. No, just ask instead, why the market women and men, the commuters, the food sellers, and ragtag mobile trolleys, and head balanced trays of condiments, utensils, and other bric-a-brac have turned their backs on that commercial hive of human activity, left it to ghosts and memories, then see if you are not prodded into mouthing the words of that iconic singer, Pete Seeger, and his memorable lyrics, where are all the flowers gone? 
What applies to Ore, of course, goes for 100 such heaving commercial communities all over the nation. The nation is dying slowly, piecemeal. Keith Richards does not, of course, explicitly echo Pete Seeger, nor indeed does my own variation on Seeger's anti-war lament published after the Civil War entitled Flowers for My Land. After reading the Richards memoirs, however, you may find yourself involuntarily wondering, as others have done, especially the remaining struggle of intrepid motorists who find themselves still obliged, often for lack of choice, to ply that Chagamu, Benin, Kaduna, Yobe, Maiduguri, and other axes of human motions. The element would read, where have all the markets gone? Thank you. Thank you. We're going to wrap it, and I'd like to end by asking the professor, and then I'll come to you for your sort of final remarks. Uh, Prof, your final remarks on this book, and perhaps we could um, end it with the issue of identity theft and uh, what is going on with fake news. Um, it seems to be a subject dear to your heart. It is an excuse as well that government has used to come down hard on uh, people who are critical of them, especially uh, on social media, because it's not as regulated as traditional media. And so what would be your solution to sort of dealing with that without making it an excuse for a dictatorial government to muzzle dissent? All right. <laughs> I've, uh, I've, I've uh, had a secret communication with uh, my trade union of geriatrics, and they've given me permission to answer this one. <laughs> you, you know, where did they find you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it, is, it is a subject about which I feel very, very strongly. The, first of all, I believe that human beings are entitled to at least one basic right. That's aside from life. We all take that for granted. Otherwise, we won't be talking about human beings. So outside life. I think the next thing is the right to your own identity. Yeah. That doesn't require money. It doesn't require uh, religious affiliation, ethnic affiliation, or whatever. But that right to your basic human identity is to me the next property inalienable. I should never be taken from any human being, however high or low. And therefore I find it, those who do, those who indulge in this, I find them below subhuman. I don't consider them human beings any longer. And I believe they should be dealt with, with the utmost rigor of the law where applicable, and even outside the law, by individuals who feel that the law has failed in protecting that fundamental human right. I think the expression crime passionnel should be extended beyond emotional entanglement between the sexes which lead to violence. I think the crime passionnel should be increased should be recognized as covering also issues like identity theft and identity abuse. I was in Athens just a few uh, uh, week and a half ago, um, the Athens Annual Forum on Democracy. And this issue was actually tabled at one of the, uh, the panels because everybody recognizes the fact that democracy is not possible it's just meaningless without this uh, sacrosanctity of individuals and identity. If, for instance, at election time, you have statements being made on your behalf, as happened now, uh, I think the second, both the last two elections, this criminality has been very prevalent. Would you find statements being made 
boxed over your name with your own, with your photograph to lend fake authenticity to that statement, and you are depriving me of my democratic right. So why, why then should I even attempt to express my political identity at the polls? If you've already stolen my identity, corrupted it, you know, assigned a position to me, then you're depriving me of my voice. And so what's the point of my fighting dictators like Abacha, you know, who don't believe in democracy in the first place? What's the difference between you, who steal my identity, and Abacha, who refuses to recognize, in fact, any entitlement to democratic identity? For me, I even prefer Abacha. At least I know that straightforward. I know what he's up to. But well, here's somebody sitting behind a computer somewhere attributing positions to me. <laughs> you depriving me of my democratic rights. It's as fundamental as that. And it's an issue which I think is being gradually recognized increasingly by governments and, uh, as I said, by organizations like uh, this Democracy Forum. But drastic action and rapid action needs to be taken. Otherwise, Third World War will be started by fake news. It can relate to an event, can relate to an organization, can relate to a nation, can relate to individuals, but fake news really is one of the most dangerous foundation blocks of, for me, hostility and even the possibility of a world war. Thank you very much, Professor Shoenka. Thank you. And Keith, um, to end, if you could um, talk to us um, again, like I said, a little bit about perhaps what your hopes are for the book, but also what you hope it will do. And before you sort of get to that, perhaps a little bit about the identity issue that the prof was talking about. Because of course, the denial of identity is one way in which racists, white people, are dealt with Africans, one of the ways they stripped them of who they are and what they are. And I'm, I'm just wondering, with expatriates, I've also come across people who see us as one, if you see what I mean. When, when they come to Nigeria and settle into Nigeria, they kind of tend to deal with us as if we are, they don't see us, that's what I mean. You know, we don't, we don't, they don't really see us. Our identity is, is a mixture of stereotypes and expectations. And I suspect that colors the way that they, they deal with us. So based on sort of your journey, um, the advice in this book, um, for those who haven't read it yet, could you sort of summarize it succinctly for the expatriate coming to do business in Nigeria? And then round it all up for us, please. Thank you. How many hours have I got to do all that? Um, no, I think identity is critical and without trying to be a psychologist, the, the damage done by the, the destruction of identity, clearly, of cultures uh, across the world by colonizing powers, whether it's in, you know, uh, indigenous peoples in Australia or in North America, South America, and everywhere. Uh, and if you destroy, destroy people's identities, then you destroy the roots and and I, I genuinely believe that so much of the disturbance comes about because people's identities um, everywhere have have been destroyed. And I think it's important that. Uh, and I think as a, that that flows, one of the so moving in to to the book. I think I hope one of the themes that comes out clearly that expatriates who come here to manage a business should understand if you don't engage with the individual and collective cultures and identities, how the hell can you expect to manage them effectively and reach engagement? And if you, if you can't, how are you going to be an effective manager if you don't do that? as well as on a personal level, how can you enjoy, you know, and the problem is, and, you know, this is what 
comes out, the pressure, increasing pressure for short-termism. Uh, and this is what I felt at Guinness in Diageo because they wanted me to make short-term decisions, what I, which I knew were inimical to the long-term interests of local shareholders. And too often now, international companies send people for two years or three years and they're not ready to make that engagement and they don't put that effort. Because, you know, if I look around, people like John and Roger that have been here for many more years than me could equally write books about engagement. Uh, it's just I'm the one that likes... I've got the bigger ego, probably. Um, but there are fewer and fewer, and the faces are getting older and older, because the guys that run... Uh, Guinness, Heineken, Nestle, Unilever, we just name all those. They come for two or three years and then they bugger off. And that is, you know, you can't build uh, long-term businesses with a short-term perspective. And that also means you need to engage and reflect. And it works in so many ways. In Prof talked about marketing now, you know, in the old days, we, we built marketing campaigns here about local people. Now, they're dictated to by global marketing groups who might have a little office, but their adverts are not shot in Nigeria anymore. They're just generic. Um, you know, I, I don't know if I put it in the book. Very early on in Guinness... We, there was a, a West African generic advert that completely failed in Nigeria and succeeded in Ghana. And we couldn't understand why. It was some of the older people here my age will remember the one with the guy with the javelin, the Guinness. Like, and it was all about underarm hair and where it was considered acceptable and where it was not acceptable. And, you know, and... and that's the sort of thing, if you don't understand local cultures, you're not, you can't even do your job properly, let alone engage. And so one of the things that I hope comes out is the importance of engaging, um, both for, for the personal journey and professional, which is why it should be a business book as well as a, just a, a memoir. Chief Keith Richards and Professor Olesho Inka. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Wow. A lovely afternoon indeed. Well, we're into the afternoon and we're rounding up. So um, the book is, paperback is 7,500 Naira only and the hardback copy is 10,000 Naira. I'm sure we all here who have listened to excerpts from the book, heard the review from Prof, listened to the conversations um, with Kaderia, know or have an idea what to expect from the book. I've seen a few people with the bags. I expect everyone in here to have a copy of the book and also get it for someone. You know, Christmas is around the corner. It will be an exciting read. So um, next I'd like to call on Keith to please come and um, give us his vote of thanks. Call Vitus. I've seen Andrew. Yes, there you are. Um, as co-authors of his next book and then he'll be signing please don't leave he'll be signing the book so you know an autograph worth keeping from the author himself Chief Keith Richards OBE aka Ghetto Plaster <laughs> round of applause thank you very much Kate well you know I could take a very long time in giving thanks but I'll just start with thanking everybody that's up here. And, you know, first of all, I've surrounded myself with strong women, so Kate and Kadria. Uh, thank you to both of you. And obviously, in particular, thanks very much, Prof. It's indeed a huge honour. And even our errant publisher, as we like to call him, uh, thank you very much. Um, I would like to thank some people that have supported very directly. I think, did I see Laddie come in? I'd like to thank Laddie and FCMB who uh, have supported. Uh, Vitus, Andrew, Kachi, uh, thank you guys. 
Um, Anders, Promesador, thanks very much. I think um, uh, UAC have donated some soft drinks. I think um, we've had some discounts from my friend um, Brian and Paul's company for wine. Um, uh, I don't think I've forgotten any of the other sponsors, but I'm very grateful because um, Coco, who's around somewhere, who organised this event, did a fantastic job. I was really, really impressed uh, at what a good job she's done. So I'd like to say, Coco, thank you. Um, uh, but more than that, I'd just like to thank everybody because I think I know most of the people here. And, you know, over the years I've been here, I've had so much warmth and generosity. I've had fun. Uh, I've had tears. I've had tears of joy, tears of anger, frustration. But amongst, above everything else, I've just had a great time uh, and had a lot of laughs. I intend to have a few more, drink a few more glasses of Guinness because although I'm not there, I keep telling everybody it's my pension scheme. I'm not going to support anybody else's pension scheme. So I hope... Uh, I'll be ready to sign books and have a glass of wine and hopefully see you go again soon. So thanks for coming and I wish you all Jersey mercies. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you to all of you. I'd just like to say true riches are people, not money. Thank you so much for spending your time with us this afternoon. Have a lovely, lovely day and God bless all of you. Oh, Glassway, I see you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Augustumi. <laughs> please get a copy of the book, please. Just seven five. Paperback, hardback, ten thousand. Gift it to somebody. Let them have the same experience you're having. Don't go anywhere, Keith. You have to sign. Coco. Coco, where's the table? Keith will be signing if you already have a book. If you already have a book, please give it to him to sign.